Welcome, Pewter Report readers, viewers, and listeners to a brand new edition of the Pewter Report podcast, energized by Celsius, the official energy drink of PewterReport.com and the Pewter Report podcast. Want to say hello to everybody just joining the episode and getting into the chats. We see you, Arcadeus. We see you, Shaggy, as well as more people file in. And we want to wait and make sure that we get as many people possible for this episode because it's a special one. It's always a special episode when we reveal another seven round Bucks mock draft. And that is what this whole Pewter Report podcast episode is about. It is the seven round Bucks mock draft 3.0. We've already had two, and this is going to be the best one yet for a number of reasons. One of them being we've hit the first wave of free agency. The Bucks have re-signed a lot of their guys. They have a couple of new additions as well, which helps tell more of the story of how the Bucks are going to address the 2024 NFL draft and as you see on the screen there's a certain position that the Bucks like early on in this year's draft I'm your host Matt Matera joined with me is the face that runs the place of pewterreport.com the man that helped build and construct this mock draft he crushes it every year with the Bucks best bets and just pinpointing areas of need for the Buccaneers. So without further ado, as the Super Chats start rolling in, let's get to the face that runs the place. Scott Reynolds. Scott, how we doing? Good. It's always fun doing uh, drafts. I love draft season. It's um, it's a little bit of a tiring endeavor because just so much film to watch, so much information to pour through. Uh, we do a lot of, of recon and, and homework. Uh, and, and I think it shows, right? We, I mean, the Peter Report staff, we're, we're at the Senior Bowl. We go to the Combine. We do interviews. We watch these players live playing football at the, at the Senior Bowl. We, we pour through the film. Um, we try to identify which players this team has targeted with formal interviews, informal interviews, top 30 visits, et cetera. Sometimes they trick us and <laughs> draft guys like Kalijah can't see last year who did not have a top 30 visit or a formal interview with the team. So um, it, it's, it's a fun process and, and Peter reports track record is, is bar none when it comes to, to accurately forecasting, which players will become Buccaneers. We've had a pretty good run. We always try to, to nail at least one. If we get one, that's, that's a success. But uh, in years past, I think last year we nailed three or four of them. Yeah, um, we we do a pretty good job of identifying for you guys, for the pewter people, which players the Buccaneers are interested in drafting. Yeah, and that's what makes this event so much fun, because when you hit on one of these Bucks best bets, it makes you feel like, you know, the player a little bit more already, because yeah. let's face it, there's tons and tons and tons of players in the draft. And I remember even, you know, before working at Peter Report, just following the draft in general. You know, your team drafts a guy. You may not know him right away. So what do you do? You immediately go to the Google machine and start, you know, typing in the name and where yeah. he played and what he's good at, strength and weaknesses. With, uh, you know, Pewter Reports coverage and the Bucks best bets, you already know the guy. You can go to yeah. Twitter and X and say, hey, I like this guy because of this, this, and that. Or yeah. I don't love this pick because this, this, and that. So yeah. uh, always and, a great deal. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say this. Uh, the one thing that I need to preface, sometimes we like the players that the Bucks draft. Sometimes we we don't necessarily like them. I remember doing uh, the mock draft, collaborating with John Ledyard a couple of years ago, and we weren't really huge fans of Joe Tryon, Shoenka, and Kyle Trask, right? And those were the first two picks. We had them in our mock draft. We also had them as Bucks Bucks best bets at outside linebacker and quarterback. So we, we nailed those picks. Neither one has really turned out to be like a home run pick for the Buccaneers. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you, I felt the same way about Mike Lennon, who was a Bucks best bet back in 2013 at, at quarterback. Like if the Bucks are going to draft a quarterback and it's going to be a, a day one or day two guy, it's going to be Mike Lennon. And it was. And it doesn't necessarily mean we're endorsing these picks or – uh, we like when we get these picks right because our job, simply put, and I kind of had to explain this to John, uh, was 
our job is to identify who the team is going to draft. We can always write opinion pieces yeah. about whether the pick was good or not, and we'll find out you know, sooner rather than later if, if these players actually pan out. But our job is to identify the players that the team has an interest in, and I think that's something that we've we've excelled at over the years. And it's it's a fun endeavor. It's yes. like a, it's like a treasure hunt. It's like a scavenger hunt. Yeah, Tr- you know, trying trying that's to. That's a good way of describing it. I yeah. never thought of it that way, but it, yeah. yeah, it definitely is for sure. We're just we're just trying to find guys that we think the Bucks are going to draft. Yeah, Woo, Richie. Uh, thank you. Yeah, before we get the show going, or I should say the mock draft going, and we're yeah. going to go pick by pick, round by round, all that fun stuff. Uh, we do have a number of super chats to get to, and you know our role. You super chat us. Yep. It really doesn't matter what the topic is. Well, we're happy to talk about it. I'm uh, starting out with Richie P. Thank you so much, Richie, for this $20 super chat. Who says, Thank you. I'm driving, so I can't partake too much. Appreciate you listen to, listening to us while you're on your drive. It's kind of cool yeah. thinking right now our voices are in your car as you're, yeah. uh, as you're on right the road. Down Please drive carefully, Richie. Uh, but I do want to show my appreciation. Uh, when are we going to build out Orlampa? I think he means the O-line, maybe. <laughs> um, Orlampa, I mean, I took that to mean Orlando and Tampa. Like, is he, is he driving? Like, are they – I want to know when the train is coming, that monorail from Tampa to yeah. Orlando. That's what I'm waiting for because that would yeah. be so great for, you know, to go to a, go to a Magic game or yeah, no something kidding, like right? that. I want yeah. that Orlampa. Yeah, I mean, uh, so, I mean, in the first pick, if if um, if that was a typo and it was supposed to be uh, offensive line um, – I, I think that that uh, Graham Barton would be a guy the Bucks are interested in. Um, we'll we'll kind of kick things off. Uh, we have another super chat to get to, but we'll just touch on the first pick. He sure. was the same player in our mock draft, the the previous uh, mock draft, which was mock two, uh, which which is Graham Barton. Heck of a player was supposed to be at the senior or at the senior bowl, opted out due to recovery from an injury and preparing for the combine. This is a player that that played five games at center as a freshman and then was the team's left tackle for the next three years. Very athletic, uh, tough, nasty, hard-nosed lineman. Kind of reminds me of Ali Marpet. Uh, matter of fact, I've had some people uh, close to the Bucks organization tell me this is Ali Marpet 2.0. Mm-hmm. And and we, we know that Marpet was a left tackle for a smaller school, the Hill Park College, but he moved inside to right guard and was just a stud and then ended up being a left guard after, and also played a year at center. But um, this is a player that I think would be an ideal left guard, maybe even try him at center and see if he can upgrade that spot from, from Robert Hainsey. But he is a day one plug and play guy, smart, uh, very technique driven physical player, just like I said, Ali Marpet 2.0. So he is a player that the Buccaneers might have to trade up for. You know, I mean, I, I we don't do any trades in our mock drafts typically, but uh, I'm not immune to the mocks that I've seen. Mm. If this team wants a, a, a Graham Barton, um, you know, you've seen teams like Dallas pick him, uh, Miami picks him, in some of these mocks, Jackson Powers Johnson's another player. Yeah, you talk about Ryan Jensen 2.0. It's this guy right here, right? So either one of these offensive linemen would be dynamite picks for the Buccaneers in the first round. They might have to trade up to uh, to secure one of these guys. Don't put it out of the realm of a possibility that Jason Light wouldn't do that. He traded up one spot to get Tristan Wirfs, as we said on yesterday's show. Uh, if one of these guys is, is within striking distance, I wouldn't be surprised at all if, if they do this. I think interior offensive line is still the priority. I know a lot of people are thinking edge rusher. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it's not going to happen, especially if these two guys are off the board. It very well could happen. But as long as there's a chance to get Graham Barton or Jackson Powers Johnson, I think Jay Slant's going to be very interested. He just spent $33 million mm-hmm. on a quarterback. He's going to want to protect Baker Mayfield. Yeah, I absolutely agree, Scott. And I don't think any team, let alone the Bucks, should go into their first round pick and say, we can only get this position. We yeah. can only pick this one position, yeah. and if our player's not there, then we got to trade back or whatever right. the case may be. I think you got to have a couple of options or a couple of ideas when you go into that first yeah. round pick. So, yeah, sure. If there's an edge rusher that they like, they'll take that edge rusher. But if there's a center or offensive lineman that they enjoy more, that will be the pick. And obviously, Grant Barton, we've spoken about a lot already. So, this one won't come as much of a surprise to Bucks right. fans, obviously. Um, 
Uh, I think we're all big fans of what he does. Um, he wins a lot with his leverage. That's one of his claims to fame as an offensive lineman and a ton of experience as well. Like mm-hmm. even as a freshman, only played in six games, but uh, got to start at center for five of them. And yep. then obviously played a ton the rest of his career um, in college football. Had a lot of good PFF grades as well, especially in 2022. Um, had an 88.2 yep. grade. Um the last two years, no more than two sacks allowed per season and under double digits in uh, quarterback hurries allowed. So yeah. just he, as steady Eddie as it really gets. He is in his tape against Jared Verse from Florida State, who's a dominant edge rusher. He's going to be a first round pick as well. Yeah. I mean, was was great stuff. I mean, he shut Verse out. So uh, I think when you look at those marquee matchups, uh, that that's NFL on NFL right there. Duke versus Florida State with those two guys. And, and I thought he really showed well. And again, um, why can't he stay at, at left tackle? He's got shorter than, than you know ideal arms in terms of his arm length, but he really projects well inside, like I said. Uh, even when you talk to him, he kind of comes across like Ali Marpet. So Ali, Ali Marpet's yeah. one of Jason Light's best ever draft picks, and I wouldn't be surprised if he sees the same similarities and, and goes for Barton in round one. Hey, I think every Bucks fan would sign up for uh, Ali Marpet 2.0, yeah. would they not? I mean, <laughs> arguably one of the best uh, Bucks offensive linemen in, in, in franchise history. So that was yeah. a little bit of an appetizer with the seven-round Bucks mock draft. Graham Barton, first-round pick. You may put the pieces together with him being on the, uh, the cover photo of, yeah. uh, <laughs> of today's episode. So before yeah. we get into more of the draft, let's get to these Super Chats. Starting with Buck Spaceman. Thanks for the five dollars super chat, Buck Spaceman, who says, Can we talk about Devin White's delusional statements? Better all around team. Was that when we were blowing his team out while he was on the bench? <laughs> yeah. Well, funny you say that, Buck Spaceman, because Pewter Report had a private conversation about this exact same thing, questioning, do the Eagles really have a better team if the Bucks were the one that annihilated them? What was that score again, Scott? Thirty two to nine. Thirty two to nine, yeah. 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 And, and, you know, um, I, I get it. Devin wants to kind of, you know, um, you know, show well to his, his new team, Philly, the team that he's longed for since last off season when he was liking Eagles posts and putting little yeah. green hearts on his social media. So, you know what? Hey, all, all power to you, man. Like you're an Eagle now and you got to kind of, um, you know, you're, you're part of that pack. You left your other pack, you know, back down here in Tampa. And so, you know, you got to, you got to stick up for your new team. I get that. But I mean, the facts are the Eagles had one of the all time tank jobs towards the end of the season. They started off 10 and one. Yeah. And looked like they were destined to be Super Bowl, you know, contenders again. And the bottom just fell out. I mean, Sirianni did a horrible job coaching, just horrible. And, you know, it, the, the, they were they were such a different team. Both teams were really from week three yeah. when when the 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 Bucks lost to the Eagles twenty five eleven here at Raymond James Stadium to the thirty two to nine shellacking the Bucks put on the Eagles. But uh, Matt, I, I I think right now, even before the draft, with all the free agency moves, if you were to have Tampa Bay play Philadelphia in ten games, I think the Bucks win at least six of those. Just right now, roster on roster, put in a neutral site. I don't care, but I, I I think they win six games. I just think the Buccaneers are a better team right now than the Eagles. I mean, uh, losing Jason Kelsey that's a big loss. It's yeah, huge, and, right? Yeah, I I have always wondered like what they would never do it, but like what if football playoffs were seven game series like they all they are right. for like all the other sports? That yeah. would be awesome, but obviously it, it, it's not feasible yeah. on the schedule. Yeah, I think it would be really close because I I think you have to understand with the Eagles, they kind of had to revamp last season in terms of they lost their – the team that lost in the Super Bowl, they lost their offensive and defensive coordinator after that because that's what happens with good teams. And I feel like that really took a step back to the point that the Eagles kind of cleaned house. They kept Sirianni, but they got rid of their offensive and defensive coordinator again. Um, the Eagles still have a lot of pieces in there, and they got yeah. Saquon Barkley. And they didn't but, have they didn't have AJ Brown either, right? And that was that yeah. Was big, they didn't right? have AJ Brown. You still got Devontae Smith. Yeah, I, I I honestly think it would be five to five. Like, okay. who's better, Jalen Hurts or Baker Mayfield? If they're like a hundred percent, I don't know. I mean, 
Jalen Hurts is a little more dynamic for sure, but that the, the offensive line, I think, might be the one that tilts it um, in the sense of the Bucs. So if it's 10 games, I honestly think it's 5-5. Five, five. Okay. If it's seven games, I'll, I'll go Bucks 4-3. I'll go okay. Bucks 4-3 in a seven-game <laughs> like series. That. I like that, yeah. So, but uh, just in case you you missed what Devin said, we'll we'll read it here. Uh, he was largely positive about his experience with the Buccaneers. He didn't throw him under the bus or whatever. But the exact quote was um, when he was talking about uh, in joining the Eagles. He said, "It's an opportunity to show why I was top five, why I helped the team win the Super Bowl, to prove I I don't lack any confidence on a one year deal. Last year wasn't who you were." There's never been uh, Devin White on tape. Now you've got an opportunity on a bigger stage. It's a bigger platform here. It's a better all-around team built right here, right now to do great things. And I want to be a part of that. So are the Eagles a better all-around team? I mean, we'll see the last time they were on the field, and that's usually where these things are settled. They weren't. So Yeah, their defense still might be in huge disarray, and I think that definitely gives the advantage. Like the Bucs offense against the Eagles – defense is a way better advantage for the Bucs than the Eagles offense against the Bucs defense. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, anyway, uh, shout out to ref fish. Thanks for the four ninety nine super chat. Who says before y'all start, well, I get Evans being called the greatest offensive player in Bucks history. He is. Uh, I feel that Paul Gruber gets forgotten equal to Werfs thoughts. Paul Gruber was, it was an outstanding offensive lineman. He, if he played for a different team, he probably is a hall of famer, right? Just in terms of, of he never made the pro bowl because the Buccaneers during his tenure were an absolute joke. I think he got drafted in 88, I want to say. And the Bucs didn't make the playoffs until 1997. So it's a long time coming. I mean, yeah. you thought, you thought Mike Evans, uh, and Levante David had to wait a while. I mean, Paul Gruber waited over a decade uh, as well to get to the Super – he wasn't he wouldn't even on the Super Bowl, but to get to the playoffs even. And, and so, I don't know, Paul Gruber was, was a very good athletic tackle, very good technician. But Tristan Wirfs is a freak. He's a freak yeah. athlete. And, and I think right now Tristan Wirfs, especially with the accolades that he has received – I think he's the best offensive lineman in team history. And I think that you put Paul Gruber second and probably Tony Mayberry third. Mayberry um, was, was a phenomenal center. Maybe, maybe Ryan Jensen and Tony Mayberry. There were two different centers. Mm-hmm. Mayberry is actually the most decorated offensive lineman after Tristan works. Now he made three straight pro bowls and was actually the first offensive lineman in Bucks history to make a pro bowl. So, um, you know, he's, he's a good player in his own right as well. Yeah, we just built out the uh, the Bucks offensive lineman Mount Rushmore. Yeah. We throw Ali Marpet <laughs> into the into the conversation yep. as well. And yeah, it's tough with offensive linemen in particular because I know like defensive line you can get more stats. And Gerald McCoy yeah. is kind of victim to the the team never really having success, even though he was a good player. And it, it, it's tough to separate the art from the artist uh, in, yeah. in this case. But Tristan Wirfs got a lot of the individual accolades already with Pro Bowls and All Pros and Second Team All Pro. But when you come in as a rookie, start every game, and you win a Super Bowl, like you're yeah. really already off to uh, a great start. But let's keep these super chats rolling. Back to some draft discussion. Yeah. Thanks to Darren Morgan for Thank this ten dollars super chat. Great day, super chats already. Uh, there are several defensive tackles like Byron Murphy, uh, Jerzon Newton, Braid, uh, Braden Fisk that can create pressure. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, the Bucks draft a defensive tackle in rounds one or two to help the pass rush. I don't think so. Not in the first round, maybe in the second round, if the right player is there, like if they had a first round grade on a player and he's still Mm -hmm. around in in round two, then maybe that's the case. The reason why is because in in the first and second round, you're looking for, for starters, essentially you're looking for guys that they can, they can like Cody Mount, for example, wire to wire starter, second round pick, you know, filled a huge need, didn't miss a single snap. I don't think. So having said that, this team has, has a first-round pick in Vita Vea. It's got a first-round pick in Kalaja Kansi. And then the year before that, the team's first pick, which was actually the top of the second round, was in Logan Hall. Now, Logan Hall has not doesn't have the promise that Kalaja Kansi does sure. and has not lived up to his draft status as of yet. He's entering year three. This is a critical year for Logan Hall, and the team probably won't re-sign 32-year-old Will Golston, who I think turns 33 this year. So 
having said that, you could make a case for that. We actually have the Bucks drafting a defensive tackle, but later, just because it's not exactly a priority. And remember that the Bucks play nickel more than they do in base defense. And so in nickel, you're going to have a, basically a four down lineman front. You're going to have two edge rushers, your outside linebackers, and two defensive tackles. And you're not taking Elijah Kansi off the field. And Vita Vea is the highest paid defensive lineman on the team, and he's mm-hmm. a Pro Bowl guy. You're not going to take him off the field. So a second-round pick for a player that is going to be seeing crumbs after the meals that Kalaja Kansi and Vita Vea are going to have doesn't seem like it's the best usage of a premium pick. I wouldn't rule it out necessarily because in base defense, when they do go to that 3-4 look, you need three, three down linemen, and they do rotate in Logan Hall, but – I think they want to give Logan Hall one more chance, a platform to to show that he can that he can be bigger and stronger this year and make more of an impact and live up to that draft billing before yeah. they go investing another premium pick in another defensive tackle. I know it was a couple of years ago, and you actually addressed it on the show already, but the, the draft class with JTS in the first round, followed by Kyle Trask in the second round, especially Trask at, at quarterback when you still had Tom Brady. Yeah, I think the Bucks kind of learned that lesson of you need to draft guys that are going to make an impact right away. And, yeah. You know, at the time, you're kind of drafting through uh, rose-colored glasses because you had just won the Super Bowl, and right. everything's great, everything's high and mighty. You could get away with – a development project situation like they kind of had with um, with Kyle Trask and even JTS to a degree because he had Shaq and, and JPP. So JTS right. had to play behind um, those guys in that first season. They obviously didn't make that mistake last year, and um, I, I don't think they'll go about it that way. It's definitely a great question, and shout out to everybody with the super yeah. chats right away because it's made for some great discussion in the middle of – this mock right. draft as well. But yeah, I, I agree with Logan Hall going into his third year. The Bucks kind of have to decide now whether or not he's going to be a future piece on this team. Because remember, he was a second round pick. So the Bucks don't have to worry about that fifth year option if they want to get away from, from Logan Hall, uh, you know, a- after this season. And you know, the whole time, Vita Bay and Kalijah Kansi are going to be the bread and butter. And with yeah. Greg Gaines coming back, there's just so many other ways that the Bucks can kind of fill it without exhausting all of their salary cap, but also adding pieces um, in the draft to other positions too. Yeah, exactly. Sal 319 with a comment here. Y'all kill me with the Cody comments like he was good. He really was trash and he shouldn't have been a second round pick. He's more of a fourth or fifth. Y'all not, y'all need to be more honest about that. Um, appreciate your opinion, Sal. I will say this. I'm not an offensive line guru, but I know somebody who is. That's Brandon Thorne. He's the best in the business. He is. He's a friend of the program. Uh, we we rely on him. He has got mad respect around the NFL. I mean, uh, NFL GMs know who this guy is. Offensive line coaches know who this guy is. Offensive linemen know who yep. this guy is. The top offensive linemen each year in the draft and even top free agent guys. And NFL players will go on his Trench Warfare podcast show and, and talk uh, offensive line and X's nose with them. And, uh, you know, Brandon Thorne, I trust his opinion m- more than PFF when it comes to evaluating offensive line play. And he said, Cody Malk had some very, very high end snaps, very high end, like starting grade, like legit. You can see the talent. You can see why they took him in the second round. Did he have some bad snaps? Absolutely. Did he struggle? Yes. Did he look like a rookie at times? There's no doubt about it. We're not putting Cody Malk. Uh, in the Bucks Ring of Honor or the Hall of Fame or the Bucks Mount Rushmore. He's not even the uh, Hall of Very Good yet. Yeah, he's not the Hall of Very Good. That's well said, Matt. But I will say this. Offensive line is a position. A, it's it's hard to step in and, and start and be a really quality offensive lineman right away. The Tristan Wirfs, those are the unicorns. Okay. Yes. <laughs> those, those are the exception, not the rule. We also have to keep in mind Cody Malk, was a, a left tackle at North Dakota State. Now, while that's been considered the Alabama of the FCS, it is still the FCS. It is not the FBS, okay? Um, it's not Alabama. It's not an SEC school. It's not even a Big 12 or Pac-12 school. Uh, it was a big jump from North Dakota State to the NFL. It was a big move from left tackle to right guard. Just ask any offensive lineman, Tristan Wirfs or Luke Gedeke, about – having to to switch hands and, and your footwork and all of that from left to right. So having said all that, 
you're not going to learn how to play offensive line in the NFL on the bench. You got to get in there and get the job done. And I think that that he was okay as a rookie. I think that he showed enough to where he learned. And and as John Ledyard, Brandon Thorne, some of these people I really respect when it comes to offensive linemen. When when they they evaluate the tape, and I and when I evaluate it myself, I don't see him making the same mistake on back to back reps. I don't see him making the same mistake very often. And and I think that he's a quick learner. He's only going to get bigger and stronger. We talked to Cody Malk. I remember Adam Slavon and I talked to him right at the end of the season. And he said, I'm going to come back looking more like a guard than a tackle. Yeah. And that you saw it. That was a transformation that Alex Kappa underwent. When you go from that kind of long, lean, athletic, tackle-type body when you're out there on the edge playing on an island, going up against pass rushers, to where the fight is in the phone booth, right? And you've got to have more of, of, of an ass, the thighs, the trunk, the core built out. And Alex Kappa, I want to say it was it was his second season, or maybe heading into his third. When he came back in OTAs, you're like, wow, that dude looks like a guard now. He's got um he, he's got the core now yeah. to anchor and to drive. And it really made a huge difference in his game. And I think this offseason, when you and I met, when we go to one Buccaneer place and we see Cody Malk in the OTAs, I'm expecting him to look bigger and stronger in the lower body. I think it's only going to help. Yeah, he's probably working out on a farm right now, lifting hay and branches <laughs> and stuff like that. Pushing I'll tractors. Quick, I'll make this point quick because we got like six more picks to get to in this yep, draft. Yep. But we've all said that Malk is already ahead of where Luke Gedeke was as a rookie, yep. when Malk was a rookie. Yep. Gedeke took a great step the second season, not That's saying right. that Malk's necessarily going to do that, but also Alex Kappa, who you brought up, Kappa, if I remember correctly, yeah. didn't start his rookie year. Correct. He did so not. Malk already has more experience yeah. than what Kappa was at when they were, you know, on the same level. Yeah. And Kappa played his way into a solid starter to get that next contract yeah. with the Bengals. So Malk, however you want to slice it or look at it, is kind of ahead of all the other guys that we praised a lot. So yeah. Um, well yeah, said. I think only great things to come, really. I, I think you're spot on, Matt. Well said. Second round, we're going with Marshawn Nealand, a Josh Capo favorite. This is this is a guy that I've really come to really like and appreciate. Western Michigan uh, edge rusher. And here's the thing. So what were to happen if if uh, Graham Barton is, is there at 26 and Jared Verse is there or Leatu Latu is there? I don't know. We'll find out, right? But I'm not sure that Verse or or Latu would be there uh, at that pick. And I'm not really sold on Chop Robinson after a guy like Joe Tryon Shoinka that that actually was more productive from a sack department at, at Washington, but is probably more athlete than football player in terms of instincts and all of that. I kind of see Chop Robinson the same way. I think Robinson is more athlete than he is finisher and football player. I think uh, Adisa Isaac, who we had in our, our second round as our edge rusher last mock draft, is is a better player. But the Bucks really like this guy, and I'm really grown to like him too. Marshawn Neeland, it, he reminds me of Cam Jordan coming out of California way back in 2011 when I was at the Senior Bowl watching Cam Jordan come out. And uh, – and I'll tell you what, the production is not going to wow you, right, in terms of, of his sack numbers. Uh, matter of fact, he had four and a half sacks in yeah. in, in last year's uh, season as well as the season before. And um, having said that, he ended up with, I believe, 12 and a half sacks in his college career. But you know what? Cam Jordan only had 16 and a half. And, and so that gives me a little bit of hope. Cam Jordan's best season at Cal was six sacks and he ended up I think having six uh, double digit sack seasons in New Orleans very physical player aggressive player attacking player um, I think Trevor Sekima said it best uh, from pro football focus um, watching him on tape is like watching a car crash I mean he is just physical as all get out and the one thing Matt that I really like about him that's underrated about Shaq Barrett was Shaq Barrett was really, really good against the run. Mm -hmm. And I know that, that the, the $17 million a year would, that was money for the sacks, but Shaq Barrett was a really complete 
edge rusher for this team. He was really good against the run, and when he was when he was uh, you know when, before the injury, he was an elite pass rusher. And then he mm-hmm. lost that step as he got older. The per, the production diminished, but with Marshawn Nealand, you're going to get a guy that can set the edge, stuff the run, which I think Todd Bowles will really like and appreciate. But then also is is a really coming on as a pass rusher, and and actually has some quick hands. He's got some good moves, but man, the guy can bull rush too. Yeah, he's got the combination of like physicality and explosive athleticism that, as like scouts and obviously GMs and stuff, that you absolutely love. The stats and everything that you just kind of put on display is certainly a concern. Like I know Scott, you're a pretty big like stats tell the story depending yeah. on the position, but you're big on like the having the production yeah. in college. Yeah. And I would argue for those that are are worried about him not having that crazy amount of production, you got to remember Western Michigan plays in the MAC, and you know I like to gamble on everything, so I've gambled right. on a pretty good amount of MAC games. Their opponents run some funky style of offenses where yeah. it's not your typical college football offense or even like NFL pro typical offense of like. We're going to have a pocket, the passing game, drop right. back for a couple of yeah, seconds. Bubble screens. All yeah, sorts it's of a lot of screens. Stuff, yeah. It's a lot of like weird option, mobile quarterback, things yep. of that nature. And that's where the physicality comes into play. Because when you come in to a different opponent each week that runs a different style of offense, mm-hmm. but a different running style or different passing style, you have to be physical. Because one week you got to get ready for not just the tackle, but the tight end and the fullback to come pulling your way. And the next yep. week you got to get ready to pin – your ears back. So I kind of like the fact that he's had to probably adjust and play against different offenses compared to like your typical SEC edge rusher or, you know, big 10 edge rusher where the brand of football is similar from really whatever team that you're looking at. So you really got to like the physicality, uh, the athleticism for sure. High motor guys, I think is the MO of Jason light. Um, Even going back to like Yaya Diaby, who, Mm -hmm. You know, didn't always have all the production. Uh, obviously, got better year by year, which is kind of the case with Neyland as well. And then look right. at with the Bucks when he finally got an opportunity. And now yeah. he's doing yoga and trying to get more flexible to increase <laughs> yeah. his sack production. So mm-hmm. wouldn't hate if, if Neyland comes to the Bucks and has a similar trajectory to what Yaya Diaby did. Obviously, they're different players, but in terms yeah. of kind of developing yeah. their game. Yeah, but both physical, big, strong guys yeah. too, you know? And so getting some more size on the edge. I mean, Shaq Barrett was not the biggest guy, right? 6'2", no. 250. But this guy is big, and he's very athletic for his size. Matter of fact, his RAS score, the relative athletic score that um, Kent Lee Platt puts out, Math Bomb, which is a great follow on Twitter, uh, he scored an, uh, an unofficial 9.54 out of a possible 10. Uh, as a defensive tackle prospect. Now, I, I'm curious as to what that defensive end score would have been. Still would have been really good from what I imagine. Um, but that's that's 75 out of 1,620 defensive tackles. And, and again, Marshawn Nealon played um, more of like a 4-3 defensive end type and with, with his size 6'3", 267. But um, I, I, I think he'd be a, a dynamite fit here. He's coming in for a top 30 visit. The Bucs had a formal interview with him at the Senior Bowl. That could or could not be a tell. We'll find out soon enough. Um, but then in the third round, we we stay with the offensive line. and uh, Or I should say we go back to the offensive line. We stay in the trenches. And, Matt, you mentioned this the other day. I forget, I forget it was yesterday or, or Monday. Doubling up at the offensive line position, yeah. bolstering that unit. And it makes so much sense. Um, I know that he's got the ugliest helmet out there, uh, that Kansas Jayhawk. It's, it bugs me. But I, I have to admit, Dominic Puny is a heck of a player. I mean, again, Brandon Thorne loves him. Um, I, I compared some notes with him, and he says yeah, he's a Jason Light type player, man. This is this is a guy that started his junior year at left guard and and then moved to left tackle last year and did not allow a sack in either season. Just a big, massive guy, 6'5", 313 pounds. And and we saw him snap the ball. He played center as well as guard yeah. at the senior bowl. Also took some reps outside of tackle. So this is a very versatile player. He gives you another player like Graham Barton. Maybe you try them both at center. See which one's better. Maybe you try them both at left guard. See which one's better. And at the very least, you've got two guys, Matt, in Barton and puny that if you need them to play tackle in a pinch, mm-hmm. I mean, you you got that guy. You still have Justin School, who's your swing tackle, 
Yeah. But you've got a guy with with legit wire to wire starting experience in college playing tackle. That's that's a huge value. We know what happened against the Rams mm-hmm. when Tristan Wirfs got injured against the Eagles in the 2021 playoffs. Couldn't play in in the very important Rams game. And then Josh Wells comes in and he gets hurt, right? So you can never have enough good guys that can play tackle, but both of these guys can play guard, and I think both of them can play center. So why not bolster the interior offensive line and get two guys? Plus, guess what? If you miss on one or one gets hurt, you got another one to throw in the mix, and you don't have to throw you know, caution to the wind and and, and bank on Opeto or Bredesen. Yeah. You've got another a pair of, of guys to come in along with those two free agents to really make it competitive in the interior offensive line. Exactly. There's nothing wrong with doubling up and again, having a guy where maybe he doesn't start right away or even start in that first season, but you have a player that you have in your organization, you know, for the next four years that you can help develop and, and see him get better on a monthly and, and yearly basis um, as an offensive lineman in your organization and it really just helps out the depth overall. Like you mentioned with Opeta and Breeson on the interior school, obviously would be the first offensive tackle to, yeah. you know, come in if something happens to the other starters and, you know, kind of pushes Brandon Walden as well too, where you have a lot of these different guys that can do separate things, but all at a better level than for example, Aaron Stinney could only play guard. He couldn't move out to tackle at all. Yeah. Couldn't play center. He couldn't play center. If that was the situation, right? Nick Leverett, yeah. at least give him the credit for doing the old college try. And he, you know, tried playing center in some preseason games. And we saw on training camp, didn't look great snapping the ball. Didn't look very right. comfortable doing it. Where some of these guys that we've talked about have at least snapped the ball and are quite comparable to it. Yep. So I, I'm all for building it out, looking at as many different pieces as possible. So why not? Why not yep. do it? We're talking offensive line right now, but as as Matt just explained the rules, when you super chat us, you right come right to the front of the line. You can change the topic if you want. It's almost like Uno, right? Where like you're a little bit, you, yeah. You play the skip card, right? Or you know, I'll skip over you. And anyways, uh, Devin G with the one ninety nine super chat. Thank you. Do the Bucks like Ke- Keon Coleman? Yes, they do, and I like Keon oh, yeah. Coleman as well. I like I, I like Keon Coleman, Keon as Coleman as well, and so does Josh Capo. Uh, Keon Coleman might be uh, in our next mock draft. Uh, we'll see. But, yes, I do think he is in the mix uh, for the, the the first round pick at number 26. Very good player. And, listen, I know we're putting a lot of emphasis on the trenches with two offensive linemen in the first three picks as well as an edge rusher sticking in the trenches as well. And, and that's really Jason Light's M.O. He's also really good at drafting wide receivers. His first ever pick was a general manager, Mike Evans, Hall of Famer. Chris Godwin in the third round of 2017. Uh, Trey Palmer, I think, showed flashes last year. And you've got Scotty Miller uh, a couple years ago. Uh, was was huge during the 2020 season. Made some memorable catches. So he's done a good job early, middle, and late finding wide receivers. Mike Evans is not going to play forever. There's going to be a, there's going to be a year where he's not going to have a thousand yards. I'm not going to be the guy that predicts when that's going to be. I'm always going to bet on Mike. Okay, and when it happens, it happens. But just like this team at, at back in 2014 had Vincent Jackson on the roster when they drafted his eventual replacement, Mike Evans, right? And, and you had two years of those two playing each other, learning from each other, etc. And I think that would be so valuable to get a guy like Keon Coleman to learn from a Mike Evans to possibly replace a Chris Godwin. After this year, this is Chris's uh, contract year. He may not be back. He'll be 29 during the 2025 season. We'll see. But, Matt, I wouldn't be opposed to Keon Coleman in red and pewter. I like his game. I think he's a better athlete than his 40-yard dash time shows. He He's a, he's an elevator. He's a skywalker. He'll go up and get it with the contested catches. Reminds me an awful lot of Mike Evans. Uh, he, he was a... Had a formal meeting with the Buccaneers yeah. at the uh, NFL Combine, as you said, um, was, was brought to Tampa Bay as well for uh, for another meeting. Um, yeah, top 30 visit? Yeah, top 30. That's yeah. that what's escaping me. Uh, love his game. Loved his answers. He said he – I asked him about playing with Mike Evans, and he said, man, just the opportunity to learn from Mike Evans, who's had a 1,000 yards. He brought up the 1,000 yards every year in his career, which I appreciated because – 
you know, not every college football player knows every single thing about every NFL player, but right. you know, a specific stat like that to remember about Mike Evans, who is a guy that every Bucks fan would agree has been criminally underrated in his yeah. career. But yeah, like Keon Coleman for so so many reasons. Um, not the fastest of guys, but a great route runner. Uh, insane with yards after the catch, which obviously the Bucks could always use a player like that, and uh, just make some incredible plays as well. Almost as incredible as the taste of all the great flavors of Celsius energy drinks. And make sure you check out the newest brand of Celsius, the Celsius Essentials. They're the tall boys, 270 milligrams of caffeine. Got great flavors like the Blue Crush and the Dragonberry. Uh, also check out their original flavors, the Strawberry Lemonade, Tropical Vibe, Peach Vibe, Arctic Vibe, um, Fuji Apple Pear, Cucumber Lime. You get the point. So many awesome flavors. If you need to know where to find a Celsius energy drink, go to the Celsius store locator, punch in your address, and tell you the closest location where you can pick one up. Could be a Walmart, Target, health and fitness store, or your bodega. Bodega. And once you keep going to your bodega, you know you want more and you want to get it in bulk, you can buy it in bulk. I'd recommend getting that variety pack because variety is the spice of life, and you heard me talk about all those great flavors of Celsius Go to Amazon, click on the subscribe and save and have it sent to your place of residence whenever you want. You're in charge. You're the captain. Just make sure you're drinking Celsius energy drinks. Celsius, the official energy drink of the Pewter Report podcast. Speaking of wide receivers, Scott, I believe uh, this next pick. Well, we have two third round picks to that's get right. to. That's right. Oh, yeah, no. that's right. Yes. Yep. So the I know the Buccaneers just signed Jordan Whitehead, and, and I know that they just signed a nickel corner in – Tavier Thomas and I like both picks. I mm -hmm. think both of those players are, are are really good additions to this team. This may seem like a little bit of a luxury pick, but man, you can never have too much help in the secondary. Yeah. So um, you wrote an article about this the other day. Great job on that. How the Buccaneers have right. really targeted some Georgia DBs, at least with their interest before the draft. Here they have met formally at the combine with three of those guys: safety uh, Javon Bullard, cornerback. Uh, um, uh, last uh, Kamari Lassiter, yep. and then the my favorite, uh, the other safety slash nickel corner is uh, Tyke Smith. And uh, uh, Tyke is man, you put on the film, he's a Todd Bowles defensive back, and I think I even got Todd to tell me that. <laughs> so <laughs> he's he's a really good player, and we know that Todd likes those Georgia defensive uh, backs because his son Troy will be. I think a starting linebacker this year for the Bulldogs as he enters uh, his um, his second season in uh, in, in Georgia. So th that's going to be exciting to see. But Tyke Smith started his career at West Virginia. Uh, very smart, instinctive player, tough, sure tackler, physical. The last two seasons, uh, well, when he transferred, he had three tackles, suffered an injury as the Georgia Bulldogs won their first national championship. And then he was a, a key player in the second national championship in 2022. 28 tackles, two and a half tackles for loss, two sacks, a pass breakup, and a forced fumble. He had four interceptions, yeah, a forced fumble, and a touchdown, as well as a sack in those two seasons of West Virginia. But, man, he really put it all together last year, Matt. 70 tackles. Eight and a half tackles for loss, two sacks, two pass breakups, four interceptions to lead the Bulldogs. Just a playmaker, and and he he is so position flexible. Um, you can stick him back there for a few plays and play uh, free safety. He's got enough speed at four four six where he can do that. It's not his home base. His home base is in the box. He is more ideally a strong safety or a nickel. But man, you put him in the slot. Um, and or, or in the box, uh, blitz him. He's just such a scheme versatile player. Reminds me a lot of Antoine Winfield and Jordan Whitehead in that respect. So, uh, why not? And I think that he's a better cover guy in the slot than either Winfield or Whitehead. So, if you want him to be your nickel, you throw him in the competition with Tavier Thomas, only signed a one year deal, and uh, and Christian Izian, and see what happens. I think this this is a really good value pick for the Buccaneers because he is so scheme versatile. Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw that this team last year, they played D Delaney at safety. They played they Zion did. McCollum at safety, but Ryan Neal wasn't getting it done or when Ryan Neal was hurt. Uh, there could be disaster, Matt, in the secondary. If Winfield or Whitehead 
go down with an injury. So you got to have another capable playmaker back there. And I'm not sure Kayvon Merriweather is ready yet to step up and fill those shoes. It's all very true. As far as on the field players out of the three Georgia Bulldogs that you mentioned, Tyke Smith is probably my favorite. And the key word, the buzzword that you said, versatility, because the comparisons to Anton Winfield Jr. and um, Jordan Whitehead, they're true. And the first thing I thought of when watching him, looking at stats, things of that nature, is the fact that he does a little bit of everything. You mm -hmm. mentioned the interceptions, the force fumble, scoring a defensive touchdown, playing in different areas. That is Antoine Winfield Jr. Yeah. to a T, playing everywhere, everywhere. And for a safety in Antoine Winfield Jr. that isn't the biggest of guy and maybe not even the most physical of guys, he's almost as good as being at the line of scrimmage as he is being, you know, all the way back. So yep. initially before the Jordan Whitehead signing, I was thinking Tyke Smith could be that next Jordan Whitehead. Now you have Jordan Whitehead and you have a hybrid of Winfield and Jordan Whitehead right. with Tyke Smith. This is probably my favorite pick so far in this yeah. mock draft. Oh, I like it. That's, that's good to hear. Um, so I debated with, with Josh Capo a little bit what to do in, in the fourth round. We originally had Arkansas cornerback, uh, Dwight McLaughlin uh, as as the the guy there, and we really like him. But it just seems to me that the addition of Bryce Hall, that, like that, that's a really good move. And you still have Zion McCollum and Jamel Dean. Um, maybe in the next round we find a, a room for a cornerback. Uh, we'll we'll shuffle the deck just just for fun. But this player here really kind of really jumped on on me when I was watching the film. Uh, th this guy he. He is electric. <laughs> Talking about Malik Washington in the fourth round from Virginia. Now, I don't like small receivers typically, right? This guy's five, eight and a half. I like guys with bigger catch radiuses, Cornelius. Um, uh, what's his last name? Uh, the Michigan receiver, I think it's Cornelius Johnson. He was another guy that was considering here. But the thing with Washington, aside from just the gaudy production and Production, you know, th th that can be a little tricky sometimes because for wide receivers, you can have so many manufactured plays, screen passes, gadget passes, and, and that, that's what this guy was force-fed. He was a slot receiver, but he was really kind of force-fed the ball. 110 catches for 1,426 yards and nine touchdowns after transferring to Virginia from Northwestern where he didn't have that level of production in any season. But the thing about Washington is this. He reminds me so much of Wandale Robinson, who was Liam Cohen's leading receiver at Kentucky in 2021. He was Will Levis's primary target. And if you look at the numbers that Robinson, who's 5'8", 185, posted that year at Kentucky, 104 catches for 1,334 yards and seven touchdowns. Very similar type player who thrived in Cohen's offense at Kentucky. Yeah. And this guy's 10 pounds bigger. He is not a small receiver. He's short, 5'8 and a half, but he's 195 pounds. To put that in perspective, Matt, he is 42 pounds heavier than Devin Tompkins is. Okay. Jeez. So <laughs> so he's short, but he is a He's a muscular, well-built dude. I mean, he looks like Ty Tyreek Hill in terms of his stature. And he's not as fast. He's a 4-4-7 four, four, kind of guy. But you talk about yards after catch. You talk about making people miss. This guy is a missed tackle waiting to happen for defenses. And for a player to play in the slot and kind of team up with Chris Godwin in that role, this is the player. And I remember having a conversation with, with Jason Light. Um and he was talking about Amon Ross St. Brown. And he's like, yeah. gosh, we don't have a guy like that that can just, you know, catch a five-yard pass and run for 25 yards and make you miss. And, you know, kind of like that that touchdown he had against the Buccaneers yeah. in the creamsicle game. And that's that's what this type of player is. He's 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 like a, a Malachor Kylie type player, just or uh, Malachi, Malachi Corley type yeah. player, just not as tall, maybe not as big at 215 pounds like Corley is, but very good player. Yeah, I, I can understand why some Bucks fans might have reservations at first based on the size, and the Bucs already had smaller guys like, like Devin Tompkins. 
But there is something missing a little bit from that offense in terms of wide, wide receivers. We can talk about the line struggles and you know tight end and, and, and things like that. But as far as wide receiver goes, they are missing either a lightning quick guy that'll make everybody miss and be that threat of like, oh my God, he has the ball. It could be a touchdown yeah. the way that St. Brown does it, the way that Tyreek Hill does it as well. Um, or there is that other option of like having a true wide receiver three that also has like size and is built like either Mike Evans or Chris yeah. Godwin. So if you want to go the route here with this pick, yeah, it's got to be a guy and the Bucks need this someone that's just electric and can make guys miss. And um, you certainly get that uh, with this fourth round pick. So yeah, I'm all for it. I just, I do worry at times a little bit of, undersized guy the Bucks have went that route yes yeah. they've had speed guys whether it's Trey Palmer whether it's Scotty Miller but that's not what you know that's not what he brings to this game that's not what Washington does as a wide receiver so yeah he's fast and we've seen other guys that are fast but he does it in such a, a different way which I think is very appealing yeah and the other thing too is I, I like big catch radiuses especially for Baker Mayfield who's not the tallest quarterback it's a yeah. big reason why six foot five wide receiver Mike Evans gets so many targets because Baker can find him but the way this guy's used, it's the short and intermediate passes. It's the quick little dump off, make you miss in the slot, and pick up first downs and all of that. So I, I think that that that's that's where he could help Baker Mayfield out. Even though he's small, um, he's going to be easier to find because he's closer to the line of scrimmage. He's going to be playing some of those things. He's the ideal guy you want on a wide receiver screen out in the flank because uh, he he's got some some make you miss qualities about him. So that is the the fourth round selection. The Bucs don't have a fifth-round pick. They traded that um, to get Trey Palmer last year. So their sixth-round pick, which they traded to Detroit, they actually got a compensatory pick in the sixth round. And, um, again, where do you go here? If this guy is available, I, I think he's a, a solid selection. Again, another senior bowl guy, senior bowl standout, Marcus Harris from Auburn. Matt, they seem to like Auburn Tigers when it comes to they defense. Do. K.J. Britt, Carlton Davis, Jamel Dean. And uh, th this this guy's a very interesting player in the fact that he really kind of came on last year. He had two sacks in each of his two previous seasons, six tackles for loss, six and a half tackles for loss in 2021, 2022. Then, boom, he erupts for 40 tackles, 11 tackles for loss, seven sacks, a forced fumble, fumble recovery, very quick hands, not the biggest guy. And I think that's why he falls a little bit to day three, 6'2", 286. That's kind of Kalaja Kansi esque, mm -hmm. right? I mean, he's got about an inch and about two pounds on Kalaja Kansi, but this guy's a very active, high motor, physical, penetrating style player that I think can be an upgrade over Mike Green and and replace Will Golston on the bench and maybe even push Logan Hall because I think he's a very active player, can get in the backfield, yeah. good pass rusher. And, uh, and and very strong for his size. Got tremendous hands. Uh, if yeah. you want to, if you want to go watch a fun little clip, put in Marcus Harris Senior Bowl reps on YouTube, and it has all of his cut ups from his one on ones. The dude has got crazy good hands. And and uh, Warren Sapps told me it all starts with the hands. The hands and the feet when they yeah. work in concert, that's an unbeatable combination. And this guy can really play. I spoke to Marcus Harris at the Senior Bowl, actually, and uh, had a had a fun conversation with him. It's funny because he's like crazy active as a player, um, but super easygoing in conversation. So he's one of those guys that can kind of flip the switch, which yeah. I think like Adam can see. I'm not comparing him to Adam can see as right. far as the player, but Adam can see is a guy that like off the field. Soft spoken, talking about finances and stuff. You coined the nickname Financial Kong Su when he yeah. would talk about all those business <laughs> right. plans. And then on the field, obviously, he was one of the best defensive tackles yep. of his era. So, you know, Harris, I think, has that same type of thing where he can flip the switch. And the production got better and better and better um, each season, which is, you know, things you love to see. Another thing I love to see is my bets winning and getting better and better and better. And, of course, if you want to bet – especially for March Madness coming up tomorrow and some games tonight. Um, you can bet over at mybookie.ag using the promo code Pewter. That's P-E-W-T-E-R. If betting on the Super Bowl is Christmas, March Madness, especially the first two days, that's like 4th of July and the 4th of July weekend. So use that promo code Pewter, P-E-W-T-E-R. Start betting on all the March Madness games. They start around noon 
tomorrow. Um, and of course, you can do it for hockey, the NBA, all the great different sports. Check out their online casino as well. Um, get a free cash bonus in your bank account. It's absolutely free in your MyBookie account. So even if you learn from Plant City Math, you know that that is a heck of a deal. So shout out to MyBookie. Use that promo code Pewter, P-E-W-T-E-R. I'm so excited for March Madness. I'll give everybody a pick right now. First game, first tip off tomorrow, Michigan State minus one and a half. All right. Book it. I'm going to have to go to my bookie and do that after the show because yeah. uh, you're usually right, and I love that about you. Um, <laughs> before we get to our last selection, which is the seventh-round pick the Buccaneers uh, will, will be making here, uh, there was some news today over at um, at One Buck Place, the Abbott Health Training Center. No, they didn't sign a player today. First day in a long time they haven't signed a player. Uh, they actually gained a tight ends coach, John Van Dam. The, the previous tight ends coach will be moving to – passing game uh, assistant that'll be his new yeah. role as he transitions there justin peel former nfl tight end played collegially at oregon and most recently with the atlanta falcons was their tight ends coach where he coached up kyle pitts and john U. smith and those guys he takes over as the new tight ends coach so um perfect segue into our final selection i almost went with running back and you know what i'm gonna go running back in the next mock draft Again, the exercises that we try to do with these mock drafts, we do five of them, is try to present players, different positions that we want to put on your radar. These are players that we've identified as, as guys that the Bucks have liked. Either they've interviewed them formally or informally at the Combine. They've shown interest at the Senior Bowl. Maybe they have been for a top 30 visit, et cetera. This was a player that um, – and so we'll have a running back probably a late day three the next time. But I wanted to put this guy on your radar, uh, Peter People. Devin Culp, the tight end from Washington. We know they like Washington Huskies. They got Joe Tryon, Shawinka, Vita Vea, Greg Gaines, Kate Otten. This is a, a guy with the big W on the helmet, so he's obviously on the Bucks' radar, right? Uh, well, they they had him in for a formal interview at the combine, and honestly, I watched a lot of Washington games, and I'm thinking, wow, Westover was actually the primary tight end. Why are they looking at the backup tight end? Well, then what is what happens, Matt? He goes out and runs a four four seven. Yeah, <laughs> at the combine, the fastest time this year for a tight end. So he is more of a move tight end, more of an H back type. And you know what? That's what they looked at with like Jaheim Bell and some of these other tight ends. Is that I think they're looking for another guy that has a little bit more speed that they can use, um, maybe in some of those three by one formations that that uh, that Liam Cohen's going to bring, where they can almost use him as a big receiver. He's not the best blocker, Culp is, so that's an area where you see him here at the sled. He's got to work on that. He's not the biggest guy. But a very intriguing selection, I think, to possibly end the uh, the, the draft here. I have his, his size wrong here as I'm, I'm, um, I'm looking. He's not 6'5", 314. I'm looking on our, our mock draft here. Uh, I'll get his, his actual size here, but it's closer to 6'3", about 245. And, uh, and so – I, I think that he is a guy that, that has some run after catch ability, good hands, and might be a player that, that brings a different element than what the bigger Payne Durham and Kate Otten mm -hmm. and Coquife bring. If they're looking for maybe a Gerald Everett type tight end, but a younger version, that's kind of this guy right here. Yeah, you got to like the speed for sure. It continues the Washington pipeline. And if I'm not mistaken, Bailey Adams wrote a story about him at the combine. Yeah. Uh, I believe he was teammates with either Kate Otten or JTS or, or both. So he does have a yeah. little bit of familiarity with um, with the Washington Huskies. And obviously tight end is a position we talked about a little bit on yesterday's show that um, I think it definitely needs addressing. It's just whether or not will they have a veteran come in or will they draft one like in this scenario? Yeah, exactly. So that's it for our mock draft show. Uh, we've We've got a really fun show on tap tomorrow. Um, it's going to be geared towards free agency. We had a lot of great questions and sometimes yes. our topics, you know, we, we do a lot of talking and we don't get to answer everyone's questions, but tomorrow on the show, it's, it's all going to be about you guys. Yeah. Matt and Adam are going to have uh, an hour of answering your questions. So whether you super chat, which we always love, we appreciate that. Or if it's just questions in the chat, Bucks free agency question and answer session tomorrow on the Peter report podcast at four. Yeah. Going to be a, a lot of fun. We'll obviously talk about maybe some options for the Bucks, certain positions. But, yeah, if you guys have certain specific questions, obviously Super Chats get to uh, get to cut the line. So we'll talk about free agency and really any questions that you have. So looking forward to it. 
In the meantime, please uh, follow us on our social media if you're not already doing so on X, Facebook, and Instagram at Pewter Report. And our YouTube channel is Pewter Report TV. Please like and subscribe and leave a comment as well below when this video is done. Got a lot of great content coming out. And as Shaggy said, hit that like button. All right, that's going to do it for us on today's show. Another great episode for Scott Reynolds. I'm Matt Matera saying thanks, everybody, for watching. And we'll see you tomorrow at 4 p.m. for another edition of the Pewter Report podcast. Out. Out.